I'm going to talk a little bit about the environmental impact of uh, renewable energy. And uh, I, I deal a lot with, with energy. That's, that's my shtick, because that's what physicists talk about. So anyway, I'll, I'll begin with some speculations here. Uh, if we had enough land covered with uh, solar collectors, and if enough wind turbines were placed in windy locations, and if we had enough storage in batteries, pumped hydro uh, systems and deep cavern com uh, compressed air systems and so forth, then we could generate the world's electricity with wind and solar. And um, that's kind of a bunch of big ifs. And what I suggest is that anyone who thinks we're about to do that is making an ID10T error. You know what the ID10T error is? Now pretend that this is a chalkboard and I'm writing on it from the back so you can read it. Okay? I D 10 T. <laughs> Go on to some uh, speculations here about storage. If you're going to store um, energy from wind and solar, you probably have to have enough storage to last for hours, many, many hours, but most likely days and even sometimes weeks, because you can have cloudy days without wind for a long time. Now, I had a debate with a guy recently about solar energy and his, or about global warming, and his solution was solar and wind. So I pointed out that he had probably, in fact, he had certainly never ridden in an elevator powered by wind. <laughs> and of course, everyone wanted to know why, and so I just, there's this deadly pause, and he finally asked me, like, why? He says, well, because if he had, he would surely have said something about the porta potty. because he's very likely to be there for a long time. In any case, you have to have a tremendous amount of storage. And of course, we don't have any storage like that. But just imagine storing all the energy in some, say, the Western grid or something like that for days. On the other hand, uh, what you could do, say, uh, consider this to be zero, the power demand looks like this, goes up during the day or the evening, just depending where it is, and back down at night and so forth, like that. This part right in here that the power level never goes below is called base load. Now, that's done by nukes and coal primarily because they're systems that uh, you don't want to turn on rapidly primarily because there's a tremendous heat capacity in the water. But suppose that you jacked up that base load, and during the night, you stored the excess energy, and during the day, you could use that energy, then the amount of storage you'd have to have is something like 20% of one day's uh, energy. So, it's a fool's errand. Um, there's another kind of storage, by the way. Uh, they, uh, this device right in here is a rotating drum. And it would be used in something like a, uh, a data center where they have to have a, they're drawing a tremendous amount of power. But in case the power drops, you want to get some reserve energy coming in a New York minute. So they do this with a, uh, uh, with a rotating drum. And the device that I'm talking about there would hold something like 25 kilowatt hours. 
of energy. That's okay, that'll ride out little bumps. Anyway, uh, back to the speculative things, uh, I'd like to comment that um, if my mother were a truck, she would have wheels. <laughs> okay, uh, a couple of notes from uh, Peter Beckman. Uh, one of them is that uh, there's no such thing as uh, safe energy. And if you're asking for safe energy, you're asking for gasoline that won't burn. <laughs> or you're asking for a bullet that can't kill people or something. It isn't going to happen. Another uh, comment that he made repeatedly, because he was comparing nuclear with coal, uh, he was pointing out that all energy saves lives. All right, and don't get ragging on coal. Don't, don't complain about coal because coal has done some absolutely wonderful things and it saves lives. Uh, so he was just doing comparisons. And to a large extent, uh, I'm going to be doing comparisons by not pointing out what you already know about whatever hazards exist for coal and oil and gasoline and all that kind of stuff. All righty. We talk about some renewable energy sources, and uh, one of them is biomass. That was primarily the only energy source for a long, long time. You know, coal, I mean, uh, wood was the primary energy source. Well, there was also animal feed because we fed animals, we, felt we fed work animals and so forth. How do you calculate that? Do you calculate how much work you get out of the animal or how much food went into the animal? And that makes a, that's probably a factor of at least uh, 50 difference. In any case, we'll be talking about biomass to some extent, which can be uh, things for like food for horses, firewood, and, uh, and so forth, uh, waste, um, ethanol, um, and so forth, uh, bio-based fuels. And then we, I'm not going to say much about hydro except to say that uh, it's a great, great energy source. People will complain that you flood some land, and sometimes that's justifiable complaint, and so forth. But basically, we've got all the hydro we can, or that we can develop anyway, so it's kind of pointless. Wind, fastest growing energy source, or maybe it's the second fastest in percent. Uh, solar photovoltaics and solar thermal. Solar thermal, as a, well, there are several aspects of it. One of them is where you just make something to heat your house in the winter. Another one is where you uh, produce electricity via steam. You just can't use some sort of a concentrator. And then there are things like tides and waves, which are uh, solar in origin. But the amount that you get out of them is absolutely trivial. It's not worth considering. Geothermal, there's basically an infinite amount that is infinitely hard to get. <laughs> <clears throat> and then there's the other, uh, which everyone talks about it, uh, you know, wind and solar and pixie other. Pixie dust. <laughs> okay, now, the ones that are starred are the ones that I'm going to discuss, at least to some extent. And I'll talk about... Uh, Biomass um, in the form of firewood, uh, corn ethanol, algae, and so forth. There was a very good paper in the uh, um, Chemical, and Engineering, Chemical and Engineering News a few years ago, two years ago perhaps, about various kinds of biofeedstocks. And so they presumably talking about energy, but they give the results in idiot units. 
If you're going to talk about energy, use energy units. So the metric that they used was tons of dry matter per acre per year. Dry matter has a certain amount of energy, 15 megajoules per kilogram. Year is a certain length of time, 31.6 million seconds. An acre is 4,047 square meters, so we should express it in watts per square meter. And the answer is that you get about um, a year-round average uh, 1.2 thermal watts per square meter. And I use a subscript T to distinguish this from electrical watts. Okay? And I point out that uh, there, there's a bunch of stuff. You, you read that, oh boy, somebody's going to use algae or something like that. They will never, ever, ever tell you how many watts per square meter you can average. They never tell you about land area. They never tell you about energy. It's just biofuels, and it's got to be good. Okay, now we have a picture of New York City in about 1890. Um, they had 100,000 horses. They produce, you have to feed them with about three tons per year per horse. You get produce 100,000 tons of uh, equine manure, 10, millions of gal 10 million gallons of urine, and more than a few flies. Well, that's the good news. The bad news is that only the elite had the horses and the buggies. The rest of the people walk through those streets. Oh, and they dump their own waste into the street. A firewood, I, I, I just made this calculation oh, 30 years ago uh, during the oil crisis. Uh, it turned out that uh, you could produce, a, 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 no, let me say this correctly. If you wanted to heat your house with, uh, with firewood, you can go out and cut down a lot of trees. In Connecticut, there's a tree that would have grown up right here by the time I, since I started talking. But um, you can produce uh, firewood uh, sustainably at the rate of about a half a cord per acre per year. Energy in a cord, acre, 4,047 meter, uh, square meters, so forth. So that turns out to be something like 1.2 kilowatts per, per hectare or 500 watts, watts per acre. 1.2 kilowatts per hectare is pretty much the same as we got for the, um, uh, for the general, um, well, wait, wait, no, no, my, my mistake, oh, forget that. Okay, it took about, it would take about 10 acres or five hectares to provide heat for the average home. Can you say environmental impact? I mean, that's, that's a whole lot of land, your house, you gotta have it surrounded by 10 acres of forest. Sorry, Jeremy, you're down in uh, Tucson, you don't get them. <laughs> Jane? <laughs> okay, now, uh, we'll talk about some wind facts. Wind turbines are designed to have about a 35% uh, annual capacity factor, which means whatever it says on the nameplate, so many watts, you're gonna get 35% of that averaged over the year. Okay, now you, you can't put these wind turbines right next to each other. They have to be spread out quite a ways and so forth. But you can average year round average power 
in excellent locations is 1.2, uh, I mean, uh, 12 kilowatts per hectare, or 5 kilowatts per acre. And to power a town of 700,000 people, that's one third of Las Vegas, takes 300 square miles. 300 square miles of turbines spread around. Did I say something about environmental impact? Tip speed, that is these big old beasts turning around like this, look like lazy circles in the sky. The tips of those turbines are going at something like, uh, well, six times the speed of the wind that's blowing them. Uh, but it, it gets up to something approaching 200 miles an hour. Uh, you don't want to be a bird in that. Okay. Wind and biofuels both produce uh, 1.2 watts per square meter or 12 kilowatts per hectare equally. But there's a difference. The biomass, the biofuel, is stored as, uh, as a fuel, and you'll release the energy as heat. The wind turbines produce electricity, which is a more valuable uh, energy commodity, although wind energy is the lowest quality of all kinds of electricity. Biofuels use all the land, and uh, turbines use a small fraction of the land. As you can see in this uh, picture here of uh, the Flint Hills region in Kansas, you can see the big green field there with these uh, wind turbines scattered around. And the biofuel energy is stored. You can use it when you want it. Uh, wind energy is capricious. You get it when the wind blows. And just by the way, in case you didn't know, again, I'm on the other side of the chalkboard. This is the amount of power vertically. This is wind speed. It comes like this. It's zero for a while and then zips up like that. Very slight variations in the wind speed give you very large uh, changes in the wind power. So I'm going to talk about a Vestas V80 2.0 megawatt. That's an 80 meter diameter device. Uh, they have two different hub heights, just depending. You use a higher hub height if you're in a kind of a low wind situation. The rotation rate is about 16.7 nominal, but uh, can go up to 19.1 revolutions per minute. So you can calculate that the wind speed at uh, for the 70, uh, uh, yeah, for nominal wind speed, uh, with, the, with the 80 meter one and you going up to 178 miles an hour would be the tip speed. Those blades each weigh six tons. The nacelle weighs 69 tons. Those are metric tons. They're about 10% bigger than a regular ton. There's more on the data, uh, more data on the Vestas here. The, um, uh, there's a hub that weighs 18 tons. The tower is 117 tons. If it's 67 meters, it's 155 uh, tons if it's an 80 meter tower. But what's interesting is uh, if you look at the center part of that picture in there, you see those that circular part coming up with some bolts coming out of it. That's what looks like the base but the base is one heck of a lot bigger. And the reason for that is that, that wind is pushing on the upper part of the tower up there, and it, put, it puts a whole lot of leverage, and the leverage is equivalent to a lever as long as a football field with a school bus loaded with kids on the other end. Okay, now, 
if you are going to have a two megawatt tower and you want to uh, produce an average of a gigawatt, you have to have 1,500 of those beasts uh, for a town of 700,000 people. U.S. consumption of electricity is 450 gigawatts. Here's a chortle for the day, and I can't even remember where I got this thing. I was laughing so hard. And bird deaths from climate change that coal emissions produce, blah, blah, blah. That causes it. Anyway, there's a picture of a uh, dead eagle. Now, there's a bald and gold eagle protection act, which has some rather onerous um, uh, consequences. You kill one of those guys, and you have a fine of $5,000, or one year in imprisonment, uh, $10,000 are, are, are not, uh, let's see, not more than two years in prison for a second conviction. That's pretty rough if, you're, if you go around killing bald eagles, unless the deaths are due to wind turbines. I kid you not. This gearbox thing uh, turns out to be one of the dicey things about uh, wind turbines. Uh, there's an article in a, in a wind magazine talking about the, uh, uh, the nasty problem of, uh, of the gearboxes. And those gear box, those gears that you see there with the men in the background give you an idea how big those babies are. Now, what you have to do with, a, with those gearboxes is take a low RPM, you know, like 16.7 revolutions per minute, or about, well, anyway, it's good enough. It's barely moving, and you've got to turn that into an RPM of something like 900. So you have to have a multi-stage gear system, and it turns out that they get hotter than a $2 pistol. And they can burn up, as you see there. Oh, did you notice the middle picture there? How many tons of that is falling down? Well, the environmental impact of that, if it hits the ground, is going to be, it's going to kind of knock into the base or something like that. If you're under it, it's curtains. OK, now, uh, I ran across a. Um, a website that is talking about um, the hazards of having wind turbines around and so forth. And it's, it's run by a wind, a bunch of wind opponents. And they're, you know, they probably have a big ax to grind. And so we have to regard their stuff uh, with a little bit of um, circumspect, I think. Somebody, there was just on the website when I happened to be there, somebody fortunately, in, in quotes, uh, stored all the data that was on the website because the people who are running it are running out of money and they can't, it'd be something like 80 bucks a month to keep that website going. So that stuff might disappear. But anyway, it's called ill wind. So you'll notice over on the left, there's a, there's a, a menu, so to speak, and you can click on that menu and you can get any of those ones that are on the right, uh, but I, I don't have them all listed, it's just, uh, just the ones I want to mention a little bit here. Now, for example, uh, here are some things that tell you about the, uh, let's say, the physical hazards. One of them is uh, up here. Uh, the electrical stuff, and down here is the turbine failure stuff. But um, let's start up there with the, well, let's go with a comment that en engineers fix things. 
they find a problem, they go ahead and fix it. And I think that most of these problems would eventually be solved, but not quite all. Um, power surges, all it's got to take is the right kind of lightning strike to knock out a control or something like that, and you can have a big power surge. Uh, I didn't mark the interference in there as one of the maybe nots. Uh, the interference that people are worried about right now, or at least the military is worried about, is that they have these radar systems scanning the skies because some villain might be sending some missiles our way. Now, wouldn't it be nice, you're supposed to say yes, if we didn't know that when those missiles were coming? Ah, you got an 80-meter tower with an 80-meter diameter fan on it, moving around like this, that's going to give you a lot of interference. You people are worried about that. The military is worried about it. Uh, the things like um, the, the blade throw and ice throw and so forth that um, are, are going to come about. If you've got a wind turbine where there's a lot of ice, you know, you have an ice storm or something like that. You're going to be throwing ice off the tip. It's not too good. And if things get out of balance, that's a heck of a lot of weight to be slinging around, and uh, the, the blades can actually uh, fly off. So we'll go on to this next pretty picture right here, uh, showing a turbine blade that came down through a pickup. Now, I don't... I don't see any blood around there, so maybe the guy wasn't in the truck at the time. So, but for timing, uh, that guy uh, would be hauled off to the hospital in a morgue, perhaps. That kind of thing, let's just say, is a little bit infrequent. Agreed? Now, we're going to compare this with nuclear. Nuclear power has provided us by now with something like 3,000 reactor years of reliable electricity with nobody hurt by the radiation that everybody is scared of. Okay? That's the comparison. There is no comparison. Wind is vastly more dangerous. Everybody reading that? <laughs> There's a helicopter spraying uh, the stuff that they use to, to de-ice airplanes on the, <laughs> on the blades of a wind turbine. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about a boondoggle. Um, when I was at UConn, we had a uh, postdoc who had come from University of Tennessee. I'd met him at Oak Ridge and so forth. And he, was, he went down to apply for a job teaching at Appalachian State, which is in Boone, North Carolina. And he thought that would be, you know, and it was, went down and applied for a job. And here was this uh, two megawatt uh, wind turbine that had been built by NASA. It was back in 1979. And so I asked Randy about it, and he said, well, the blade was flat, horizontal. And he had asked him, well, there's some wind around. How come that thing isn't turning? Well, it turned out that the residents complained about two things about this wind turbine. The first and perhaps least important one might have been more important to them at the time, was that it interfered with TV reception. Now, that's an easy problem to solve. It's called cable. You don't need to, that's not a big deal. The other problem was that the, um, the wind turbine made the ground shake subtly, but they made the ground shake, and, you know, if this room were just kind of shaking a little bit all the time, it would feel a little bit earthquakeish, And the residents hated it, and they just insisted that the thing be uh, shut off. 
I have some notes on there, that, but I'm going to talk now about the stability issue. Uh, a three-bladed turbine is more stable than a two-bladed one. This is going to be your physics lesson. Okay. I have a book here. I would have brought a physics book, except I didn't know how to read it. This is called Eats, Shoots, and Leaves, or Eats, Shoots, and Leaves, and it's about punctuation. Uh, do you all know what the uh, uh, Oxford comma is? They say A comma, B comma, and C. The comma after the B is called the Oxford comma. Okay, now, um, listen carefully. I want to thank my parents, comma, the Pope, comma, and Mother Teresa. I want to thank my parents, comma, the Pope and Mother Teresa. A little, a little bit scandalous there? <laughs> okay, anyway, I brought the book for a demo. This is the face of it. And if I rotate it around this axis right here, it's the hardest to rotate. If I rotate it around this axis, it's the easiest to rotate. If I rotate it around this axis, it's in between. Now what I need is someone who has never done this, and so you. Woody, your job, should you decide to accept it, is to take this thing, toss it up in the air, spinning it around that axis. Okay? Face the crowd. Now, now notice he's got the front. There he's got the, yeah, the front of the book is at the top. Okay? Now, now spin it. Well, okay, you can catch it next time. But anyway, <laughs> I forgot to say that. Good. No, that's no, it's quite stable. Watch this front. Okay, front. Now do a rotation around this axis. Now with this, this is the top of the book. This is the bottom. See that? Now you do that. Just toss it up like this, and then catch it. Yeah, if if you can. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, doctors, doctors, doctors. Okay, here we go. Watch this. That's the top. Top. Now, I'm going to rotate it around this axis with the in-between moment of inertia. I have the spine on my left. I have the open side. Uh, so I have rubber bands around here. Okay. Want to try it? Now you make sure you catch it. Spine on the left. Where's the spine? Ah. Okay. Now the spine's on the right. Well, got to do that. Now the spine's on the left. It's on the right. That's an instability. Okay. Now that gives you an idea of what happens when you have a uh, a blade, this is an airplane uh, uh, propeller. It has a, an axis, it's got the highest moment of inertia, a middle and a smallest. In, there's the highest, the lowest, and the in-between. And then what you can see is that there is going to be a certain amount of instability uh, upon yawing. A yaw is when the, uh, the prop turns from this direction to that direction. Get it, y'all? Three-bladed uh, propeller doesn't work quite that way. You can work out the calculus if you want to. Report back to me um, by 4 o'clock. Uh, 
And it turns out to have identical moments of inertia around any two perpendicular axes, uh, two perpendicular to the main spin axis, and that makes it a lot more stable. That is why they have three-bladed wind turbines. Just in case you, well, that was your physics lesson. Okay, now we're gonna talk about what's called vibration, low frequencies, and mechanical stuff. Now what happens is that when the blade passes in front of the legs, there's an interruption in the stream flow, and that is about like pushing on the wall like this, thumping it like that, okay? Steady wind against it, blade comes in between, it stops. So that is what puts the vibration into the ground. That'll happen a two-bladed, three-bladed, four, whatever you want. Okay, you get this whomp whomp. And it is very, very hard to block out low frequencies. You can't filter them out. You look at a wood stove, you don't see any infrared, but you can feel the infrared, okay? You cannot hear infrasound, but you can feel infrasound. That's sound of very low frequencies. Now suppose there's a rock concert going on. What do you hear if you're a block away from the rock concert? Boom, 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 okay? And there's no high frequencies. They are rapidly attenuated, the low frequencies, go right through, and the infrared, uh, infrasound goes very, very far. That's why miles away, people could be complaining about the vibrations in the ground. Okay, the rotation rate, we're doing kind of one figure accuracy here, uh, three bladed thing, uh, it's going 15 RPM, that gives you 45 beats per minute, we'll call that a thump per second. The arithmetic isn't accurate, but any attempt at accuracy here would be silly. Um, seismic waves for small to, to moderate earthquakes are in the 0.1 to one thump per second rate, and so forth, and so the Wind turbines could put sounds into the ground that are right in that frequency range where uh, moderate uh, earthquakes occur. And another thing that can happen is that uh, when you have these gears with three stages to increase the frequency from roughly 15 RPM to roughly uh, 900 RPM, that's a factor of 60. And in three stages, you might have frequencies of, say, uh, one quarter, one, four, and 16 uh, cycles per second. And it's all in the infrasound that you can't hear. Now, if you are measuring noise uh, or sound, people use the notation dB. That's decibel. And the equation for it is uh, the sound level in, in our n and db is 10 times the, lo the logarithm base 10 of the power ratio. So it's defined basically on a ratio basis. Every step of 10 db corresponds to a factor of 10 in the power. Uh, for example, with respect to audible sound, refrigerators in the range of 50 db, a lawnmower is in the range of 90 db. That's 10,000 times as much uh, power density as uh, the refrigerator. But dB what? The curve at the right shows the human response of the ear to uh, sound level pressure. Uh, and what you notice is it's not a, not a flat curve at all, but there's 20, 20 uh, 40, 60, 80, 100, uh, phone, uh, and over to, over to the left are the dB ratios. Uh, but when you talk about dBA, which is what po most people measure with the dB meter, you're talking about a number that is corrected for the ability 
of the human ear. You talk about DBC, you're talking about um, actual power levels independent of whether you can hear it. So get out your DBC meter and it's not going to be any good for measuring sound from wind turbines because the DB meters uh, generally don't measure frequencies below about 20 hertz, 20 cycles a second. So they miss that 10 and one cycle per second and so forth. So anyway, your very high power level just to be audible at 20 hertz and that's how you would kind of extrapolate it up to uh, 10 hertz or less. And you have to be really, really loud before you can hear it. And, well, you can't hear it, so who cares? But you should. Okay, now we got these health effects that are said to be due to wind. Now, you people, all you doctors understand this thing. There's a lot of... Uh, Oh, yeah. psychosomatic under, you know, exaggeration or something like that. So maybe, the, maybe those things aren't really uh, realistic. And you, you get this thing whenever people are opposed to a project. A comes before B, therefore A cause B. It's kind of, it's kind of illogical. In fact, it's quite illogical. But there are certain persistent things that are related, you know, kind of very directly related, and they seem to be uh, sort of everywhere. Now, one thing that they have is, well, you don't have these cell phone towers all over the place. They got one here, one over there 10 miles, and one over there 10 miles. They got a blinking light at the top to warn off planes. Well, imagine you've got one of these things every uh, thousand feet or something like coming in a huge thing. Where do you put the light? At the top of the tower, not at the top of the blade where the blade can go. Anyway, they got blinking lights there. And those blinking lights can be rather bothersome for people who are in the neighborhood. Okay. And then there's a, another local problem, which is called flicker. It's not my friend. But imagine the sun is over there, and we got these blades going around like this, and your house is over there. So there's a shadow that crosses your house, and a shadow, and a shadow, and a shadow. Uh, and this is bothersome to people. Well, it's the kind of thing that uh, makes you a little bit uh, have trouble concentrating. And then there's the noise and vibration kind of stuff. The, the vibration at the low frequency uh, is going to give you some, some problems with, uh, people have found out problems with balance, uh, with, and there's just vibration. I don't know, what, that's just a topic they've got there. Is sleep disturbance and so forth. Okay, so that's kind of the problems that you have with, uh, with wind. Now we're going to talk about photovoltaics. Also, there's a lot of land area in there that is not used up. Now let me show you why. If you had the sun, look at the lower picture there. If you had the sun coming in directly overhead, you could have the solar collectors be edge to edge to edge. That only happens in places like uh, Boulder, and Berkeley. <laughs> 24 hours a day, the sun is directly overhead. Um, now, if you take those things like this and turn them up like that, the sun is coming in this way, there's a shadow area. The sun comes in here. This part of the second thing is in shadow. So, you can't use that space, so we have to move them a little farther apart so they look like they are over at, at the right and in the picture. That's why they're spread out that way. It's because of shadow effects that can occur either seasonally or diurnally. 
nocturnally too if you're uh, in Boulder. Okay, um, and what are you gonna do with that land in between the solar collectors? You gonna farm it? Get your John Deere tractor and go down there? Corn is as high as an elephant's eye. Block, oh my God, you're killing our sunlight. Photocells are necessarily diodes. They have to conduct current one direction, okay? So the next picture here is a rather interesting thing. It shows um, the efficiency measured vertically versus the year uh, horizontally on the axis. And all those different lines are different um, attempts, let's call it, some successful, some not, at uh, developing photocells. Uh, this is produced by the uh, NREL, National Renewal, Renewable Energy Lab. And you notice that the efficiencies up there get pretty high, uh, up there around over 40%. Now the way they get that is by having a multi-band gap device. The um, sunlight is a wide spectrum of light, right? A photocell, if the energy of the photons of light is too low, they don't work. If it's right on, they're super efficient. And if there's more energy than is needed, then that energy is just wasted thermally. So they have that, that sort of edge is called the band gap. They have triple band gap stuff made of really, really exotic stuff. Anyway, you'll notice in the upper left there, I'm, don't even pretend to read it. Uh, those different colors in there refer to colors on the graph and they're just talking about the uh, kinds of, of uh, cells that, that are being used. Um, the exotic multi-layer cells, they got many dopants. I'll tell you about dopants in a minute here. They got three junctions, uh, two junction, two junction, and so forth. And they use stuff like uh, germanium, indium, gallium, phosphide, and uh, silicon, and so forth. Now, single junction gallium arsenide. Uh, you notice it says concentrator and the silicon, uh, crystalline silicon over here, it says single crystal concentrator. And there's a couple guys showing off a concentrator. And why would you want a concentrator? And the answer is that sunlight is coming in and separating the electrons but they want to go back. They want to go back. This is called recombination, okay? There's a fight between generation and recombination. The more generation you get, the less important the, uh, um, uh, the uh, recombination becomes. But <clears throat> what you have to do with this kind of thing is you always have to have the device facing the sun in order that the light is focused down onto that tiny little cell that you've got there. They don't work too well in Boston. <clears throat> okay, but where, where they can work, they, they do a, a fairly decent job. Um, okay, and if, the, if you don't have bright sunlight, if light is just diffuse, you get very little light onto the, onto the cell. They've got a kind that's possibly easy to manufacture. As long as you have some thin films with copper, indium, gallium, and selenium, and uh, cadmium, and tellurium, and silicon, that's all right, hydrogen, and so forth. But what are you going to do? Where are you going to get all of those exotic materials? You're going to go mine them. You're not going to grow them, you're going to go mine them. So that presents a little problem. And they're not terribly efficient at this date. 
Now, another little quick physics lesson, just because there's a point here. This is uh, an ion implanter. And the industry where you are manufacturing computer parts, computer chips, or photocells, some of them, what they do is implant ions. Over there at the left lower, it says ion source. And that's kind of, kind of an art, so it's called ion sorcery. <laughs> you get some ions, accelerate them up to a mass spectrometer, which then uh, allows you to, uh, say, accelerate further, only gallium or whatever you're going to do. Accelerate, you got a high voltage col column there. Uh, and then you have a focusing mechanism and then some scanners that move the beam up and down and back and forth so that they form a kind of a raster uh, onto the, onto the uh, disk of silicon that you got over there. Um, the device by Extreon costs about a million or half a million bucks. We once, once got one. We got only the guts for 60,000. But anyway, um, the, the upshot of, the, of that is when you do this implantation, the typical depth is something like 100 to 500, uh, uh, much closer to 100 usually atomic diameters. The typical dopant concentration is a part per million. Is you got a million silicon atoms and you got one boron or one phosphorus or one gallium or something like that. Typical wafer thickness is something like uh, 100,000 uh, atomic diameters. And so as a waste thing, you have silicon with absolutely negligible amounts of, uh, of this, these nasties like cadmium or whatever might be in there. So that isn't, it's really not much of a deal. Um, but you do have to, you have to uh, dispose of waste. And now uh, I'm going to go on and talk about waste disposal from many things here. Um, how long do things last? The generators in wind machines will probably last 40 years. They use, may, you may have to go do a repair, but they're going to last 40 years anyway, maybe 60. The towers, we, Vestas has a plant in Pueblo. We've had a couple tours of it. They make marvelous towers. And they're made to last 30 years. Uh, and they, they just go out of the way to make sure that nothing can rust. Um, blades are beginning to be a problem, especially in offshore units. Uh, they, they don't last terribly long. They're fiberglass composites and they get a little bit of vibration from wind and sandstorms and everything else is not too good. So they, they last 10 to 15 years perhaps. They got a question mark at. Photovoltaic cells uh, 15 to 20 years. Now what happens with photocells is that they lose something like 1% uh, of their uh, capacity every year or something like that. So they just degrade and then they eventually lose their effectiveness. Batteries it typically last something like five years. If you're going to use storage, you're talking about five year, five year life of those batteries. Uh, this is a picture that I took, the upper one there, uh, shows a bunch of uh, blades that are being stored at the Vestas plant in Pueblo. And you really ought to see the thing. I mean, those blades are from that corner to that corner, something like that. They're long blades. And um, down at the lower left or lower right, you see that uh, some consequence of a mechanical failure of some kind. Anyway, that junk has got to be disposed of. There was a article in Chemical and Engineering News, which is part of the American Chemical Society, about the disposal of waste from renewable energy and stuff. 
And they're talking about turbine blades there. And the material value, they said it's not assessed. That's another way of saying ain't worth a damn. Blades are essentially worthless, uh, used. They're just a composite, a fiberglass composite that they can't use very well. Well, maybe they can use some kind of process to turn that into insulation or decking for your backyard or something like that. But uh, there, there's, there, there's not anything of any particular value in the turbine blades. It just isn't there. Batteries, well, you know, we all have lead acid batteries in our car and there's a century's worth of reprocessing batteries. You go get a new battery, you leave the old one behind. And they reprocess it, you know, they reuse it, they recycle it and that kind of stuff. And it is to be expected that they would do the same with any battery that's worth, worth anything, right? You got a battery that's this big, it's gone, it's gone defunct, but it's got a lot of uh, lithium in it. You're gonna save that lithium and make new batteries. But there is a lot of stuff that uh, there has got to be recycled or thrown away or something like that. But the battery replacement is going to happen several times during the, during the lifetime of one of those, either the photocells or the uh, uh, wind turbines. So if you're talking about a system where you are going to back up all of your energy with batteries, you got yourself a kind of a major problem. Lithium batteries, you can see, uh, they're, they're something like, in one of those batteries, a couple thousand dollars worth of metals. That's worth recycling. And I'm sure that they will do it. There'll be recycling factories. But the industry will be enormous. Now, with solar panels, there's a lot more to solar panels than just the, just the PV cells. Um, and here are places where the, the solar panels might be coming from throughout the world and so forth. Uh, the material value in a solar panel that sold for $500 is a few bucks. It's hardly worth doing it. And let me tell you, when you implant something like boron, phosphorus, uh, cadmium, whatever, into a photocell, you, you have one kind of criterion that most people don't think of. And that, ask the question, why didn't they use aluminum instead of boron in a P-type semiconductor? Probably never thought to ask that. The reason is because the aluminum is the wrong size to fit into the silicon matrix. The boron fits, okay? So the long and short of this, you wind up with this array of, um, well, it's a silicon wafer with a bunch of stuff in it. It's very hard to separate it chemically because everything is kind of the same size. And so it's, it's a really big problem. Solar thermal electric, this is a picture I took uh, in California at, uh, what's the name of the place down there, Southern Cal. What they do there is they have these reflectors that reflect sunlight. If you look at the middle one there, you see there's kind of a white line there. That's really hot. The sunlight is reflected on there. It's circulating an oil called thermonol which will go and heat water to run a steam cycle. Um, and th th you'd also notice that there's nothing growing in between. They have to clean those babies off several times a, a year. In fact, it's more often than that because if they get a little bit of dust on them, the focusing properties become lousy. Sends the sunlight off like that instead of toward the target, and they become very inefficient. But the long short of it is, when you get around to uh, saying, I'm going to surplus this stuff, 
I've got to get rid of a whole bunch of steel. Well, that's okay. We almost all uh, iron that's used in this country is uh, coming from it's coming from recycling. Okay, but there's things like uh, the, there's a lot of just metals like rebar in the concretes and, and so forth. You got to get rid of thermal, and this system uses also some kind of a salt that uh, goes from liquid to gas at a, at a critical, uh, liquid to solid at a critical point, and that's where it stores heat. And then you've got a steam generator and the generator and so forth. That's the stuff that gets recycled there. Now we'll talk about the greatest hazard, which we have ignored. So there's the doctor speaking to an audience about toxins in foods things like aflatoxin and so forth. And so he asks, uh, what is the most dangerous thing to eat? The geezer says, wedding cake? <laughs> okay, so what's the greatest energy hazard? by far not having it. Okay, that is by far the greatest energy hazard. Okay, so go nukes, go coal, go natural gas, and in the words of John Rose, all of the sensible. Not all of the above, all of the sensible. And with that, a thank you. Could I say a thing about thorium reactors? It'd be nice. Um, there, there are people around the world who are working on thorium reactors. Uh, thorium itself is not fissile. No, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it's not fissile. It can be made uh, into a fissile material by the absorption of a, of a neutron. Becomes Thorium is 232, one isotope. Add a neutron and becomes uh, thorium-233, and to a large extent, that acts like uranium-235. They've not been terribly successful so far in making thorium reactors. I wish they would. There's a lot more thorium than there is uranium. And one big advantage is that you don't create transuranics. And transuranics are the thing that get people uptight about, this will last for millions of years. Of course, one thing always to remember, the more radioactive it is, the shorter is the half-life. The longer is the half-life, the less is the radiation. I've been looking at the levelized cost of electricity, and I've learned that solar is really expensive. True. And wind, if you just look at the levelized cost, it seems sort of competitive. But I presume when they're doing that, they're not taking into account that it's intermittent and you need baseload sources anyway. Is, 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 that, is that a trick that the wind advocates do? I have a saying that uh, all salesmen are liars. Um, and, and yeah, it is. There, there's there's a, big, a big trick there. And then... Let's say that you are operating the grid and you have to buy electricity from these various suppliers and put it on the grid and keep the grid stable. So the normal thing is to look for the cheapest electricity. Well, you don't get to look for the cheapest electricity. What you have to look at uh, by law is the electricity that has the cheapest differential cost. Well, there's no differential cost for wind. In other words, if it suddenly comes up, you got, in quotes, free energy, but the, the grid operator is required to pay you full tariff for whatever the electricity is, uh, is costing you if you have the solar unit or the wind unit, but you are put to the front of the line because you have no differential cost. See what I'm saying? No, because no, because I don't know what a differential cost means, but, but I mean, it sounds oh. like those are irrational laws, and, and I mean, we're kind of 
I mean, I try and think about what, what we would do in a better world. Uh, well, okay, let me see it's, if I can say what differential cost is. Uh, you've got a wind turbine sitting there and nothing's happening. Then the wind comes up and all of a sudden it's generating however many megawatts or something like that. Um, going from zero power to whatever, however many megawatts, didn't cost, didn't add anything to the cost and therefore I, as, a, as the operator of the grid, have to give you preference because uh, it didn't cost you anything to produce the excess of electricity. But the amount of money I have to pay for you uh, will be what's your total cost, including all the equipment that you had uh, and you know, all, that, all that kind of stuff. So I'm paying you a much higher cost, much more for electricity than I would a coal operator. Okay, so we, we don't have a, a free market in energy, really. No. But, but perhaps they do in some other countries. Um, not that I know of. Darn. Uh, in, in Denmark and Germany, they have the highest cost of electricity around because of all the wind. And when the, when the wind comes up, you see, in, in, in Denmark, they have an old electrical system that was designed around combined heat and power, they call it. You got power stations that produce electricity and then the waste heat is circulated around to various buildings, apartment buildings and so forth to provide heat, uh, maybe for process heat for some chemical factory or something like that. And uh, okay, now it's all balanced. Up comes the wind. Electricity rates, electricity comes up. You got a lot more electricity on the line. But now if you turn down that power station, these people over here don't get any heat. So what they do is they <laughs> put the electricity on the grid and sell it to hapless people elsewhere, but, but they lose money all the time. But they make up for it by high prices for their local electricity. I mean, it's, it's all rigged in favor of wind and solar, uh, very clearly, so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.